Okay, well, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Amy Jewett, and I am the Invasive Species Coordinator at the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy and the Pennsylvania Natural Heritage Program. And I'm really excited that you all are here today. Uh, looks like we have 27 attendees so far. We do have a total of almost 90 people that are registered to attend today's training. So hopefully more people will be joining us as we uh, continue uh, on with our training today. Um, so I just want to mention um, a few quick things before we get started. Uh, so today's webinar should last uh, at least an hour. It may go a little bit longer, perhaps an hour and a half. We do have a lot of content we want to make sure that we get through. So if you're able to stay on for the whole time, that's great. If you have to leave early, there will be a recording that will be sent out afterwards through email. So you will be able to watch the whole thing at a later time if you need to. Also, there is a Q&A and a chat that's available to you. So if you have any questions that you'd like to ask throughout the training, you can feel free to type them into either the chat or the Q&A. Um, Brian Daggs, who is our invasive plant ecologist at the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy, he's joining us today as well, and he will be able to help answer some questions that may get asked uh, through during the training. And then any other questions that are left over or get asked at the end uh, will, be, will be answered at that time, uh, either through the Q&A or the chat, or we will try to answer those questions verbally. Okay, um, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, so I am pleased to be uh, joined today with two additional individuals who will be bringing their expertise on um, the subjects of a spotted lanternfly and Tree of Heaven. And so we have uh, Flor Esvito. Flor is an assistant professor of entomology and arthropod ecology at the Pennsylvania State University. She's based at Penn State Barron and at the Lake Erie Regional Grape Research and Extension Center. She has actively conducted research with spotted lanternflies since 2019. And specifically, she is investigating the effects of spotted lanternfly feeding on grapevine health and yield. We also have with us today, Scott Solander. Scott received a BS in forest management from the University of Missouri and an MBA from Penn State University at Barron. He is an ISA board certified master arborist, a utility specialist and an SAS certified forester. Prior to joining Penn State Extension in 1995, he served as a tree worker for electric line clearance contractors and as a utility forester. He joined Penn State Extension to teach communities and volunteers across Pennsylvania about tree landscape benefits and management. So thank you both uh, to Floor and Scott for being here today. Uh, and they'll be uh, speaking a little bit later, but I'm gonna go ahead um, and introduce today's uh, presentation. Um, and then uh, Floor and Scott will be uh, sharing their information as we go through. So I'll be getting started just by giving an overview of the event that we're going to be uh, talking about and what you all are here to here to hopefully participate in. Um, so we'll, we'll get started with that uh, first thing. And then Floor will be giving an overview of Spotted Lanternfly and Scott will be giving an overview of Tree of Heaven. And then I'll continue on after there on how to claim the survey area, or we're calling them grid squares, places where you will conduct your surveys, how to report your findings, and then any uh, wrap up information and questions will be answered at the very end. Okay, so I'll go ahead and give a um, get us started on an overview of uh, the event and what it's all about. Um, so of course, you know, the main focus of what we're trying to do here with this survey is, is all about spotted lanternflies. So this is, as many of you know, probably uh, a very highly regulated pest in Pennsylvania. It has a lot of significant impacts, um, uh, first and foremost to the economy, but also to our um, environment as well. It has a lot of negative impacts. And so the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture is the lead agency that is in charge of conducting uh, surveys for spotted lanternfly. Uh, they're the ones that establish the quarantine zone that um, covers a lot of the state already, and also collecting um, observation reports that are coming from the public. And so our program, the IMAP Invasives program here in Pennsylvania, 
is trying to supplement those efforts by encouraging additional folks to get out and survey not only for spotted lanternfly, but also Tree of Heaven, which is its favored host tree. And we're going to be doing that starting here uh, in the summertime and going throughout the fall. And so our goal with this event is to do several things. So by encouraging more people to get out and to survey, we really want to get more eyes on the ground and hope to ultimately prevent or limit the spread of spotted lanternfly in our state. And we also wanna to try to aid the efforts that are already happening, especially in places where we can detect this pest early and hopefully respond to it rapidly, also known as early detection and rapid response. And so by doing this, we're essentially being very proactive uh, in trying to get a better handle on where this pest is at, especially in parts of the state where it hasn't been found already. And we're deeming those areas the most highest priority, again, because we're trying to be proactive in this approach with this event. So everyone on this um, webinar training today, I'm gonna to refer to you as a community scientist, someone who doesn't necessarily work for the Department of Agriculture, but you still have an interest in this work to essentially be part of the solution and part of the work to try to um, you know, rapidly respond, you know, early, uh, detect early this pest. And so there is a lot of value to that. And we really appreciate people that have that interest and the time to devote to something like this. And so we really need trained individuals, which again, after today's training, you all will be considered trained for this, to choose one or more locations to survey. So that's the first thing that we're gonna ask you to do. And we do have set up a special um, GIS-based interactive map that you can choose one or more locations to survey at throughout the state. And then after you choose the locations that you want to survey at, you're going to go and survey for spotted lanternfly and tree of heaven. And we're gonna ask you to do that about two to three times throughout the year, throughout the summer and the fall. Certainly you can do more surveys if you would like to, but we're asking folks to at least go and do their surveys two to three times um, at least. Um, and then any findings that are um, reported, and again, we'll talk more about where to report your findings that may certainly warrant follow-up action, especially if it is for a spotted lanternfly. Um, but again, we're surveying for Tree of Heaven as well, because as I mentioned, that is the favored host plant of spotted lanternfly. And so if we can get a good handle on where Tree of Heaven is being found, it may help to indicate locations where spotted lanternfly is also present. Um, and so generally tree of heaven is not prioritized for removal. It is very widespread in our region, but because of the presence of spotted lanternfly, there are efforts and certainly more of an interest to try to manage tree of heaven. So as to also then manage and control the population for, um, for spotted lanternfly. And so as you are conducting your surveys, again, about two to three times throughout the summer and the fall, make sure that you're then reporting your findings. And that's going to include both presence and not detected information or absence. We, um, so not detected is also referring to absence information. And we're gonna have um, two places where you'll report your information and that will depend on what you're finding. Um, and again, I'm gonna go over those details a little bit later, but uh, we'll be reporting finds to either the IMAP Invasives database or Penn State Extension's online reporting tool, which collects information on where spotted lanternfly is being found, the presence of that pest. Okay, so I'm gonna stop talking and I am gonna turn the reins over to Floor and she will be giving you information uh, and details about spotted lanternfly. So Floor, take it away. Thank you, Amy, and good morning, everyone. So let's start. Um, the insect is known as a spotted lanternfly because of the spots that the insect has on its wings. So it's, uh, it has brown wings with black spots, but the insect is not a fly. Um, next, please. So the insect actually belongs to the order Hemiptera and the family Fulgoridae. So those names might not mean anything to you, but what they really mean is like 
all hemiptera insects have these uh, mouth parts that look like a straw. So they are like needle-like mouth parts. And in this picture in the center, you can see the mouth parts of this insect um, like going down from the head, like from the top of the, I, my mouth doesn't work, so <laughs> uh, the, um, the head on top and then a black needle-like structure in between the legs that go down, that goes down. So those are the mouth parts of the insect. And this insect feeds on plants. So what it does is that it pierces the stems or the bark of plants, and then it sucks up the semi-liquid diet from there. So they feed on plant sap. And to distinguish males and females, uh, it's pretty easy because it's just by looking at the tip of the abdomen. So for example, females have this red coloration at the tip of the abdomen, whereas males have, they have none, there is black. So that's how to distinguish males and females. Okay, next please. So the insect is native to China and South Asia. So you can see Southeast Asia. So you can see here in the map, these um, orange spots on the right. That's where the insect is ori it's originated, originated. And from there, it is spread to Korea, Japan, and more recently to the US in 2014. Next. So within the US, the insect was first detected in Berks County, Pennsylvania in 2014. And from there, it has spread to 45 counties within Pennsylvania. So in this map, uh, the counties that are colored in blue are those that are currently included in the quarantine zone for uh, these different states. And in addition to Pennsylvania, the insect has spread to 11 additional uh, states in the Northeast. So the insect is moving. Okay, next. So the, the map before is where the insect currently is. Now this map shows where the insect could potentially be. And so how was this map generated? Researchers uh, at the US Department of Agriculture and the Institute of Ecology and Geography in China, they studied climate data. And with that data, they model what other places would offer potential suitable habitats for this insect. So in the US, their findings show that most of the New England and the Mid-Atlantic states are parts in which the insect can actually um, develop. So here are the in the colors you can see. So the ones that are orange are the places in which the insect seems to have um, all the conditions to develop. So, and those are therefore categorized as uh, places that are vulnerable for, the, um, for this insect. So very much New England, mid-Atlantic states, as well as uh, Central and Pacific Northwest, are vulnerable to the establishment of a spider lanternfly if the insect makes its way there. Okay, next. So the insect has a one year life cycle. The eggs that are here on top are laid in the fall and the first instar nymphs hatch in late spring and they molt three times for a total of four nymphal stages. So the time of development of these nymphs is a little over two months from May to late July or early August. And in August and September, then the adults hatch. They mate and they eat before they start laying eggs. So the time that it takes from first instar hatch to adult depends on temperature. When the temperature is warmer, then the insects develop, they develop faster. So these months that I have here, they, it depends. It really depends on how warm um, they get, okay? So, okay, next. 
Uh, let's put all the images there. Okay, thank you. So the eggs are the overwintering stage of this insect. The eggs are laid in rows as the first picture shows the one on the left, just rows or egg of eggs. And then females cover those eggs with a secretion from their abdomen. And at first, when the secretion is laid like fresh, that secretion looks whitish. And then with a few, within a few hours, then it looks brown. And as you can see, when those eggs are laid on a rock or on the bark of a tree, then they're brown and they're very hard to see unless you are specifically looking for them. So the point here is that those eggs blend very, very well. Okay, next. So how do the different stages look like? Here on the left, we have a picture of a freshly laid egg. Uh, is, this is an egg mass covered with the secretion that I was just uh, discussing. And the first instar, which is here no, um, labeled as early names, the first instars look black with white spots. And instars, first to third instars look exactly the same. The only difference is that the later instars are a little bigger. And then we get the last instar stage and that changes in color. So it's, is like um, here labeled as late nymph. And those look red and black with white spots. But just notice that it's not only the color, look at the shape of the body of this insect. So it's good to know the color, but it's also, because there are other insects that might have these colors, but also the shape of the insect. So I, I guess for me to, to try to give you an example on how the shape um, looks like, it kind of looks like a sting bug, but um, it has these colors. Okay, and then the adults uh, are brown with black spots, and that's how they look when they are at rest. But when they have their wings spread, then they look, if we see, if we go to the next slide, then we start seeing colors. So the wings that are closer to the head are brown with black spots, but the wings that are closer to the, to the tip of the abdomen are black, white, and red. Those and those, um, you can easily distinguish them, but only when the wings are spread, okay? All right, so how do spider lantern fly moves around? The insect walks, the insect jumps, and the insect fly. So the nymphs are, they, they cannot fly, of course, because they don't have wings. So they walk and they jump. And the adults, they walk, jump, and fly. They have very strong muscles that allow them to jump very hard, very fast uh, when they are disturbed. So, so they, the insect can move by itself, right? But it can only move so far. Mostly, this insect disperses by uh, humans. So the insect is an excellent hitchhiker, and especially the eggs. We are great at dispersing eggs because, because we, don't, um, we don't realize that they, they just blend pretty well with the environment and we just sort of don't see them. Okay, so next step, next slide. Okay, so what is particular about this insect and why does it disperse so easily? So for most insects that feed on plants, usually eggs are laid at the food substrate, like very close. So when, when those eggs hatch, then the, the early stages of the insect have food right away. But this insect particularly, it doesn't care. It lays eggs on very much anything. So for example, here we can see the different objects in which eggs have been found. And what happens is that by doing so, they can be dispersed more easily and without us even knowing, unless we really look for those. And that's how the insect made it to the US because it just blend pretty well on a rock and we couldn't see it. So next. And here is an example. If we 
don't know anything about the spider lantern fly and how the eggs look like, we wouldn't even notice that here there is an egg mass. So it's just, it's a strategy. The insect really moves easily by blending in the environment by laying eggs on so many different surfaces. Okay, next. So what have been the economic impacts of a spider lanternfly? It has been estimated that the economic impacts on agriculture and forestry in, in Pennsylvania um, have been pretty high. So here we have some numbers. They have been about 13.1 million in the quarantine zone, 7.7 .7 million in the counties that are close to that quarantine zone, and it has been about 42.6 million statewide. So it has been big. It has the impact is is not just um, is something we should care about. Okay, next. Okay, so. What happens when this insect fits on uh, plants? It, and let's get the next picture too. Thank you. So the insect fits on plants up, but for some plant species, this can be devastating. It can actually kill some of the plants, but for others, it doesn't. So the, the impact it has one is for from directly feeding on the plant and draining all of that. Uh, plant sap and the nutrients that the plant has uh, inside. But then the other impact that it has, next slide please, is that, um, oh, okay, and sometimes the insect is actually able to kill plants. For example, this is a vineyard in the southeast of Pennsylvania that was repeatedly infested by spider lantern fly. And over a few years, the vines die. So it can actually kill grapevines and can kill tree of heaven. Um, so far, those are the most susceptible plant species that we know of. Even though it fits on so many, these are the ones that we know the insect can kill. Okay, next slide. So in addition to feeding on plants, the insect also secretes um, a sugary solution that we call honeydew. And because it's sugary, then it promotes the growth of other microorganisms. So for example, in infested areas, we can see these black uh, spots on trees or on leaves, and those are uh, mold. That is mold that grows over that sugary secretion that spider lanternfly secretes. And that is a problem because it blocks um, photosynthesis, they, the plants don't have this green area to photosynthesize. Next. So this is a grapevine and we can see these shiny spots here. So those are freshly secreted, um, so, uh, this honeydew from the insect after feeding on those plants. And again, the problem is that mold grows on them and it blocks photosynthesis. So two ways in which the insect affects plants. One, by directly feeding on them, and second, by promoting the growth of sooty mold that interferes with photosynthesis. Uh, next, please. Okay, so besides this uh, damage that the insect causes to agricultural crops, the insect also affects other um, other parts of our economy. And one of them is real estate. For example, this is a house in the quarantine zone in which, uh, you know, heavily infested by a spider lantern fly. And on the left, we can see these steps. So black, the first two are black, the other one is a little bit more clear. So the first step was actually washed with a pressure washer, and the other two are just covered with the mold that grows on that honeydew. And then on the right, we have these trees heavily infested with a spider lantern fly. And down, we can see the mold growing at the base of those trees. So basically, it's aesthetic. Um, it decreases the value of the property and is less appealing for buyers. And that's how it affects uh, real estate. Okay, next. So 
it also affects the transportation of products because uh, all the um, products that are being transported from a county that is under quarantine have the risk of transporting eggs. Mostly, I mean, all stages, but mostly eggs because eggs are hard to see. So for example, we have Christmas trees. The insect lays eggs on Christmas trees. I mean, it lays eggs on anything, right? The insect doesn't damage, doesn't feed on Christmas trees. But when those Christmas trees are cut and are being chipped, then they can transport egg masses. And that's a problem because then uh, people need to take extra time inspecting those trees to make sure that there aren't any life stages in there. And that is just an example. It is the same idea for other products that are being transported from the quarantine area to other parts of the state or other parts of the country. They have to go through all of those uh, steps to make sure that they are not transporting life stages of this insect. Okay, next. The insect also affects the production of honey. So it doesn't harm the, the bees or the wasps in any way. So what happens is that as the insect secretes that sugary secretion, then it attracts bees and wasps. And they, they eat on that and they take that stuff to the hives. And then the, these solutions, these products get into the honey. And the honey changes flavor and it also changes the way it looks. So it, it, it's a different product if they feed on honeydew from the spotted lanternfly. Next. So where can we find this insect? If we are within the quarantine zone, then the insect can be found anywhere where there are plants because the insect feeds on so many plant species. It does prefer tree of heaven, but in the absence of tree of heaven, you can find it in any plant. So it can be found in the backyard, it can be found in, you know, close to buildings, it can be found anywhere. Um, the nymphs though, the nymphs do prefer to feed on plants that are more tender, like uh, herbaceous plants. And the adults, they like to feed on more woody tissues, so they are more easily found in the trunks of trees or, you know, more woody uh, plants but it can be found very much anywhere. Um, next, please. So there are a number of resources that can be helpful if you have any doubt about, okay, how does the insect look like? I found something that looks similar, but I'm not sure if it is. Then just search online and just type, how to identify a spider lanternfly or Penn State Extension Spider Lantern Fly, and you will find all kinds of things that will that will help you um, determine whether you have a spider lantern fly specimen or not. And what we are recommending is if you think you find a spider lantern fly specimen, kill it, take a picture, and report it to PDA. And there are you can report this finding by phone or you can do it online. So just type in the computer how to report spider lanternfly in Pennsylvania and the information will come right there. Okay, next. So I think that's my last slide. And I don't know, Amy, do you want to do a Q&A at the end or should we answer questions now? Um, yeah, we'll save it till the end so we can keep moving along, yeah. Okay, well, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Flora, very much. All right, so that was an excellent overview. And now I'm going to transition over to um, Tree of Heaven. And Scott, if you are ready, you can go ahead and take it away. Will do. Thanks so much, Amy. And uh, thanks, Flora, for getting us started. I, I think that uh, my will try to slip into Flora's logic and, and just take up where she left off without too much repetition here. Uh, now, as you know, uh, Atlantis altissima, known as tree of heaven, 
is a rapidly growing and deciduous tree native to that very same host range that Dr. Acevedo described, Northeast and Central China, as well as Taiwan. And it was first brought over here to the United States, to Philadelphia area in 1784. Also, immigrants working on the railroad later introduced Tree of Heaven to the West Coast in the 1850s, perhaps for medicinal uses they had in their homeland. The Asian railroad workers brought it over, and uh, now there it was very popular. Uh, seeds and bark of the roots were used in treating dysentery, malaria, tapeworm, and rapid heart rate. So now, interestingly, it was not effective in treating roundworms and earthworms, but uh, anyway, it was widely used there, now, not so much in the West. We, uh, it became popular here on the East Coast from New York City to Washington, D.C., up till about the early 1900s when we decided that really it was a pretty weedy tree and it was uh, its other characteristics uh, lost, uh, were lost to us for, for desirability. <laughs> uh, go next then, thanks, Amy. Uh, my uh, reference really uh, lead you to the Tree of Heaven publication uh, prepared by uh, David Jackson and Sarah Wurzbacher and Art Gober on the left here. And the, uh, again, uh, we have a Spotter Lantern Supply Management Resource landing page, Penn State Extension, uh, and this publication is found on that resource landing page. So you can Google up Tree of Heaven PSU and that'll get you to the uh, very publication here. Good pup. Uh, next slide, would you please, Amy? Now, really, I don't want to stretch our goals. Uh, we're really learning to scout today, but uh, further, perhaps you're interested in controlling Tree of Heaven and reducing the risk of the incidence of spotted lanternflies. So we'll work into that. And Amy can kind of be the judge of how far we want to go into that today. Next, Amy. So say defining risk, uh, is the chance of something bad will happen, will cause harm, damage, and disruption within a management time frame, as defined by the International Society of Arbor Culture. Say a low risk situation would be one where we don't have spotted lanternfly and we don't have any hosts. Well, we do have a lot of hosts here. Uh, we have Tree of Heaven, of course, and it, we have several of the favorites of uh, spotted lanternfly here. Now, a very high risk situation as we see in Eastern Pennsylvania is one where we have a lot of spotted lanternfly and we have a lot of hosts. So uh, the, uh, hopefully we'll land somewhere in the middle and stay up to the upper left-hand corner of that risk scenario. Go ahead, Amy, next one. This is the tree of heaven in a park-like situation. They can become a big tree, uh, 80 feet, wide 60 70 feet tall and usually you don't see them like this usually next slide amy they'll be in clumps and because of their nature they have such a prolific rooting system that anything happens to one tree others from the root sprouts take up and the root sprouts are called Ramex, and they can uh, prolong the life of this tree for hundreds of years. Uh, as you see, now there are a mix of species here, and the red circle really shows us a tree of heaven among its companions. Now, right here in this stand, this was uh, just where you'd find it, back lots, uh, ignored situations, uh, and so we have Tree of Heaven, we have sumac, we might have some walnut in there too, and I'm not sure what the tree was behind. It might have been an elm tree behind uh, the Tree of Heaven in this photo. They are, they tend to be allelopathic, so some things can get along and other things can't. And the seed of Tree of Heaven won't germinate in a heavily shaded situation. It's intolerant of shade. It's the roots that really carry it on in this case. Uh, next slide, Amy. Please, thank you. So one tree really doesn't live that long, perhaps 30 to 70 years. 
it's those root sprouts that keep it going. And the raiment is what they call that clonal offspring of the roots. So go ahead, Amy, next one. <clears throat> what we're gonna see now is, uh, these are all fresh photos, by the way. So these are all, let's say, Memorial Weekend, Northwest Pennsylvania. Uh, and the, the sprouting and leafing is, is what we'd be seeing here today. And uh, now on this, uh, they say that Tree of Heaven really has two kinds of sprouts. One, the long one might be 18 feet long and sterile, but the, it's the short ones, the branch types, say a foot and a half long, and those are the ones that flower. Now you see a little twiggy structure in the top of this clump towards the sky, and that is the flowers just developing. It's going to flower here in June, maybe a couple of weeks. So that, I don't know whether it's going to be a male or female, but I see, um, I saw female trees nearby. Usually we have some female flowers or, or seeds uh, still hanging on from the female trees. These are dioecious usually. That means that uh, the flowers are born, the sexes of flowers are born on their own tree, male trees and female trees. But uh, they found that uh, sometimes uh, some trees will have both sexes and both uh, sexes will be in one flower. They'll have perfect flowers. Uh, go ahead, Amy. I, we, today, uh, since we see leaves out there, I just wanted to play with the leaf key. This is the 4-H leaf key. Now, if you have leaves, we really rely on them, but we have other things. We have twigs, we have bark, we have buds, flowers and fruits, and all these are available in different seasons. All winter long, we had the bark and the buds and the twigs, and we had leftover fruits. But today, we're going to look at uh, structures of the leaves. And next slide, Amy. And just taking this quickly through uh, structure language, this is a simple leaf. And it only has one blade. And you know you have a whole leaf when you have a bud at the base of that leaf stem and a leaf stalk. The leaf stalk is called the petiole. Next slide, Amy. This is a compound leaf, and I describe this as a pinnately compound leaf. It's shaped like a bird's pinnate pin feathers. So it has several blades, and that leaflet at the end is called a terminal leaflet. Up at the end would be the terminal. And again, it has a bud at the base of that leaf stalk. The petiole below all those leaflets is called, or the stalk at the end, the bottom of the leaf blades is called the petiole. The blade, the stalk of the leaf up in among those leaflets is called the petiole for just for common knowledge. Uh, next slide, Amy. This is a palmately compound leaf. It's kind of like a star. And the each blade is a leaflet. Again, you have the leaf stalk and the bud at the end of that leaf stalk uh, based on the, the parent limb, the branch. This is palmately compound. Go ahead, Amy. Leaf margins are really described intuitively so that they help, uh, help us visualize what we're looking at. And so we see different kinds of serrations, uh, notches in the leaf. You got big notches called dentate, which should resemble the tooth. And you have in the bottom, you have the lobed, which would be like our fingers or our ear lobes. Now on the right is described as entire, and that is a smooth margin. And that's what we're dealing with with Tree of Heaven, the smooth margin. Go ahead, Amy. So we'll play with the key in this particular tree and tree of heaven is what we have. Go ahead, Amy. The first question you'll look at is you uh, work with the key is, are you looking at leaves that are needle shaped or scale shaped or broad and flat? Now, mind you, it's all these leaflets together. We're looking at something broad and flat. Okay, Amy, next slide. And the next question is, are the leaves arranged oppositely each other along that twig or alternately? And you'll see in this photo on the right that we have one leaf 
one node or one bud, one leaf originates at each place along that stem. So they call that alternate. And most plants are arranged in an alternate pattern and the branch structure follows this pattern all the way up through the plant's life. Up at the end of the twig, if there were a bud on the end of that twig, it would be called the terminal bud. Now you see where the leaf attached to the twig, when that stem is taken off the plant twig, that is called a leaf scar. And you'll see the vascular bundles connecting the lifeline of that leaf to the plant. So you could get water into the leaf, water and nutrients and photosynthates or sugar is what the plant produces, what that leaf produces back to the plant to feed the rest of the plant. Those are all characteristic of each particular species as is that leaf scar. Now, here's the thing to me that looks like a, a stink bug. This is a very large leaf scar. It could be a half inch across. You, know, you might describe it as a B-shaped leaf scar or a shield shaped or heart shaped. Tree of Heaven has a prominent leaf scar on that twig. And that twig is a thick twig. Actually, bot botanists would call it a stout twig. That doesn't mean it's strong because it's not a strong twig. It snaps easily. It's a brittle twig. And it has a, a brown spongy pith inside. Uh, and you, you, might, you might find this would uh, be stinky or odorous or odiferous. And often they'll describe that odor as rancid peanut butter. Uh, that helps you identify the plant. Now, at the top of this leaf scar, that top of that shield shape is a brown dot, and that is at the next bud. If anything happens to that leaf, then, or that leaf, yeah, that, of that leaf, then it has that next bud ready to pack up or to go. It's ready to unpack that uh, next leaf out of that suitcase of the bud. So it's a defense system. Uh, and also that leaf scar serves as an abscission zone. If anything happens to that leaf, that separates that leaf from the twig so that no little, well, it controls the harm that might come to the twig. It, it blocks insects, it blocks diseases and other harm from reaching that twig. Okay, next twig, or next twig, Amy. Next uh, slide, Amy. Thank you. The, so the next question in our key would be to ask whether this is a simple or a compound leaf. And we already know that this is a compound leaf with many blades or leaflets. Okay, Amy, next one up. And just so you know, the sap here is not milky. Uh, many plants have milky sap. Uh, sumacs have milky sap. Uh, so uh, this helps. You have a clear sap with that slight odor, uh, or it might be a heavy odor, it depends on time of year too, or where you got the sap, but it's a clear sap. Uh, next slide, Amy. The next question asks, uh, is the terminal leaflet usually larger than the others? And here the answer would be no, or terminal leaflet, if there is one, may not be a terminal leaflet, um, is going to be uh, as the same size or smaller, might be absent. Uh, you, among the leaflets, so you might range from 15 to 41 leaflets along that leaf stem. So big leaf, might be a three foot long leaf on this one. Next question, Amy, next um, slide, Amy. And then we ask, are these leaflets pointed or round or are they notched? Uh, this particular one is pointed. All these will be pointed. You see how it distinguishes it from, say, black locust, for instance, which will have a rounded leaf. Okay, next question, Amy. Next question will be, are these leaves hairy or smooth? And we have a lot of companion species that will have hairy characteristics, such as walnut, uh, uh, say, uh, staghorn sumac, they'll be hairy. But ours are smooth on Tree of Heaven. You can count on that being smooth. The twig will be smooth. And so I actually, although I, I see it stated where it might have hair on the backs of the leaves, some cases, but usually you could count on it being smooth. Uh, next slide, Amy. Less than seven inches or greater than 12 inches long. So we know it's gonna be a long leaf. That is gonna be um, our lanthus. Um, uh, next slide, Amy. 
Now, so here we are in our twig uh, as it stands a couple days ago, and you'll see again uh, that flower structure developing, or perhaps it's some leftover. You see, perhaps up towards the top of the slide, uh, some leftover uh, seed clusters from last year to uh, my ruler here. So that's a foot long of that twig so far. Young bark is uh, here, it's brown. Uh, we noticed that it was green in the earlier slide. It, it ages towards more of an ashy gray appearance. And uh, next slide, Amy. There we go. Uh, this is probably a 20 year old stem or trunk. And you can see how they describe it as the texture appearing like the skin of a cantaloupe. Uh, so it stays pretty smooth throughout its life. Even that big tree we saw in the park had pretty, pretty smooth skin, um, a pretty smooth bark. Okay, go ahead, Amy, next one up. But we I, I didn't have a picture of fresh flowers. As you go to other websites, you'll see that when it blooms, it will have uh, yellow flowers. Uh, they're gonna be somewhat of a fuzzy appearing flower. Male flowers are really said to be odorous because that will attract pollinators and the female flowers will not have an odor. Apparently, the, the, the staminate flowers look the same. And of course, maybe both sex will be in the flower, although that's unusual. What we see here is last year's seed clusters on that big tree that stood alone. Uh, and this tree, uh, to me, did not quite look healthy. Again, it um, is susceptible to verticillium wilt, so I can always hope. Uh, although that will be one of my scouting sites that will leave us. Now this happens to stand among a grove of walnuts. Uh, so you can see the two together. And uh, this really is very distinguished from the walnut trees. Now those seed clusters about now, uh, next slide, Amy. You might see one seed dispersed out or you might have a whole cluster fall off. Now these are winged seeds, are called samaras. They're one seed in the middle of those two wings. And since it has two wings, they call it a schizocarp. That uh, might, it, the, to say the wingspan might be an inch and a half long and the width of it be a half an inch long. And they're often twisted. So they'll come sailing down like a helicopter, makes them great for dispersal in the wind and water. They float very easily. So very effective. Uh, very efficient photosynthesis, high uh, rate of uh, 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 germination, uh, and no wonder it's so successful in the landscape. Uh, okay, next slide, Amy. As we, now I don't want to stretch our goals. Our, our goal today, of course, is in scouting and identifying tree of heaven. Uh, but as you can run through the management scale, you would start with the cultural control. You would encourage it, the things that you want and uh, make keep them healthy and strong. Perhaps we try <clears throat> to go into step two, mechanical control, physical control. We try to pull the seedlings. Uh, perhaps we try to cut the tree. Uh, for this particular one is for uh, spotted lanternfly. You see, we're, we're gonna scrape and smash eggs. You can tell that that's oriented towards the insect, but the logic remains the same. We really don't have a biological control recommendation for Tree of Heaven yet. Uh, now, reduced toxicity, chemical remedies, uh, folk remedies, we don't recommend that. They're untested, they may not be safe. And uh, so we, we will get further into chemical control and I, I don't intend to stretch our goals today, but, uh, and Amy, you get the hook uh, whenever we have reached the point where we're not gonna talk anymore. Uh, chemical control would use herbicides and uh, effective management in that plant's control. Uh, next slide, Amy. I let Dave Jackson really uh, go further in describing our plant, and he actually he talks about control measures for as long as you want to go in that realm. Uh, so Dave and Sarah and Art uh, have done research for years on this plant and control measures. And uh, if you want to click on that link, this is on YouTube videos, and one can access it uh, as you like.
tree of heaven, Atlantis opissima, commonly referred to as Atlantis, is a rapidly growing invasive tree found across much of the United States. It aggressively reproduces by wind dispersed seeds. Female trees can produce more than 300,000 annually. Once established, trees spread by root sprouts that can extend up to 50 feet away from the parent tree. Root sprouts as young as two years of age can produce seeds. Due to its extensive spreading root system and root suckering ability, tree of heaven is difficult to control. However, if you follow the guidelines outlined here and are persistent, you can successfully eradicate it. Mechanical methods such as cutting or mowing are ineffective at controlling tree of heaven. In fact, cutting trees can make the situation worse as trees respond by sending up dozens of stump sprouts and root suckers. Hand pulling young tree of heaven seedlings when the soil is moist can be effective. However, it is often impractical to do so. Here you see hundreds of seedlings that germinated in a small area. For hand pulling to be effective, you must remove the entire root system. Even small root fragments can generate new shoots. Be aware that seedlings are easily confused with root suckers, which are nearly impossible to pull by hand. To control tree of heaven, you must control the root system. The most effective way to do this is by applying a systemic herbicide at the optimum time of year. Systemic herbicides must move through the tree's vascular system to the roots to be effective. Therefore, you need to apply the herbicide when the tree is moving sugars produced through photosynthesis down to the roots. This is best accomplished in mid to late summer, July through September. If you apply systemic herbicides to tree of heaven outside of this optimum time of year, you will injure above ground growth, but you will not effectively control the roots. In other words, the foliage may die, but the roots will remain intact. This is also why treated tree of heaven stumps with herbicides is not effective. When you remove the top of the tree, you are removing the mechanism that moves the herbicide downward. So the herbicide cannot effectively control the roots. Stump treatment of tree of heaven will keep the stump from resprouting, but it will not prevent root suckering. Before removing tree of heaven, treat them with a herbicide first, allow 30 days for it to take effect and then cut the tree. There are many herbicides effective at controlling tree of heaven. For most treatments, we recommend using herbicides containing the active ingredients glyphosate or triclopyr. For up-to-date herbicide recommendations, refer to the Penn State Extension website. Always follow the herbicide label instructions for rate, application methods, and personal protection. There are three herbicide application methods effective at controlling tree of heaven, foliar, basal bark, and hack and squirt. If trees are small and you can spray the leaves without contacting nearby desirable plants, you can use the foliar application method. Foliar sprays are also good for initial treatment of dense or extensive infestations to eliminate small low growths. Then follow up with a basal bark or hack and squirt application on remaining larger stems. A mixture containing glyphosate and triclopyr is best for foliar treatments of tree of heaven. You can apply foliar treatments using a low volume backpack sprayer as shown here, or with high volume truck mounted sprayer. The basal bark application method is suitable for trees up to six inches in diameter. The trees shown here are good candidates for this method. This method is very selective, so you can target tree of heaven without harming nearby plants. Use a low volume backpack sprayer containing a concentrated mixture of triclopyr ester and basil oil. Apply the herbicide solution from the ground line to a height of 12 to 18 inches completely around the stem. It's important that you treat completely around the stem so that the herbicide intercepts the complete vascular system to the root. The hack and squirt application method is another highly selective alternative for treating tree of heaven. You can use it for trees one inch in diameter and larger. To use this method, space downward angle cuts or hacks evenly around the circumference of the tree and apply a herbicide solution to the cut. You can use formulations of either glyphosate or triclopyr amine. By intentionally leaving uncut tissue between the hacks, you provide open pathways for the herbicide to move to the roots. Use a hatchet with a narrow blade to make the cuts in the tree. 
To create a more effective hack and squirt tool, you can modify a regular hatchet by grinding down the blade so that it's no more than two inches wide. This modified hatchet would create a narrow cut to better hold the herbicide. The rule of thumb for hack and squirt applications is to make one cut per inch of tree diameter with a minimum of two on small stem. For a six inch diameter tree, make six cuts evenly spaced around the circumference of the tree with intact bark left between each. Then fill each cut with herbicide solution. Again, be sure to apply herbicide treatments in mid to late summer to maximize herbicide movement to roots. After the initial treatment, monitor the site for signs of, of regrowth and retreat as necessary. Initial treatments often only reduce the root systems, making follow up measures essential. This is critical to prevent reinfestation. Well established Tree of Heaven stands are only eliminated through repeated efforts. Persistence is the key to success. Thank you, Amy. And uh, actually, the rest of my slides we can move through pretty quickly because Dave has really uh, brought us up on that. So you, Dave mentioned the management calendar. Go ahead and, and move on up, Amy. And <clears throat> these uh, effective herbicide treatments that uh, they recommend are <clears throat> in that brochure of Tree of Heaven. And of course, many are available. A uh, small brush, uh, you can treat, uh, if you can get over the top of it, then with foliar applications and uh, move up, Amy. Uh, basal bark and hack and squirt treatments and uh, from July through fall. I know that uh, if, after leaf fall or when leaf fall is coming close, uh, don't rely on hack and squirt, rely on basal bark treatments. Uh, go ahead one more. Uh, we really don't uh, recommend just cutting the tree down without treating the stump uh, because for instance, down in the lower right hand corner of that slide, is the next generation. And I don't know why we don't have more in here. I guess the Japanese knotweed that you see in the bottom left corner and it's proliferic, uh, proliferating on that slope uh, is apparently taking that site over more strongly, but we're going to see many more sprouts on this particular site. This tree was cut down about a week ago. So it was a mother tree right on the banks of Mill Run and a very harsh site, uh, just exactly what Tree of Heaven grows well and outcompetes others in. Go ahead, Amy, next slide up. So we don't recommend uh, using or relying on stump treatments, although if you cut the tree, <clears throat> uh, we you probably want to use a stump treatment on it. Go ahead, Amy, next up. And so label is the law. If you use an herbicide, be sure to follow the label directions because that's for your safety and is for the best uh, effectiveness of your operation. Uh, go ahead, Amy. So don't use home remedies. Uh, they, they aren't tested uh, culturally, maybe they are, but we surely don't recommend them for your sake and for the sake of the environment uh, and for your safety uh, and operation. Go ahead, Amy. So Dave Jackson and Sarah and Art prepared the video and that publication. And in the last slide is me. The next one up, uh, well, it's not. Uh, field training, oh, shameless marketing. That's, uh, we have, this is a time dated uh, opportunity, but uh, on June 30th, uh, they have a field session in uh, Reading. <clears throat> so you can sign up online, just Google up Tree of Heaven uh, field training uh, and catch it before June 30th because uh, you'll want to get in. Okay, uh, thanks, Amy. That's the last slide. That's me. Hey, thank you so much, Scott. That was really great. You're okay, welcome. so um, we're going to dive into um, the actual survey aspect of um, today's training. So we got a really great overview on spotted lanternfly from Floor and a really great overview of Tree of Heaven from Scott. Um, so we're going to jump into this next part. So claiming a grid square, which essentially, again, is referring to um, where it is that you'd like to survey for spotted lanternfly and tree of heaven. So here's the steps that you're going to want to follow to go about doing this process. So if you go to our program's website, which is paimapinvasives.org, 
and go to our events tab, which is up in the main menu or the main um, horizontal menu. And then if you see on that page, there is a um, describing uh, today's training. In that description at the very bottom is a button that says claim your survey locations. So you'll wanna go ahead and click on that button and it will take you to an online interactive map that looks like the screen capture that you see here on the left-hand side. So this was developed by one of our GIS folks at the Conservancy, her name's Molly Moore. She did a fantastic job. Uh, I definitely could not have done what she did. Uh, so I really have to give her kudos and uh, for all the great work that she did in putting this map together. So if you notice, the first thing that you're looking at here on this uh, map that we have put together is essentially a mirror of the current um, spotted lanternfly quarantine zone in the state. And if you'll notice, and I know it's sort of hard to see here, so I'm gonna jump to my next slide. The colors of the map are indicating the ways that we are prioritizing uh, this survey and how we would like people to survey as much as possible. But again, surveying anywhere is gonna be really valuable. But if you look at the counties that are colored in red, these are the counties where spotted lanternfly has not yet been detected in Pennsylvania, according to what is on Penn State Extension's website. So these are our highest priority areas that we are really encouraging people to go and do surveys at for spotted lanternfly. Again, remembering that the main purpose of this survey is to be proactive, to be going to these areas where we don't yet um, have any evidence that it's uh, at, but it, it certainly could be. And so if we get more eyes on the ground, hopefully we're going to help those uh, existing efforts by the Department of Agriculture to help inform if there is something that needs to get acted on quickly, if there is an infestation of spotted lanternfly in those areas. Then we have our orange counties. These are areas where spotted lanternfly has been discovered this year in 2022, so fairly recent findings. Um, not all of the um, uh, counties that are colored orange, it doesn't mean spotted lanternfly is in the entire county. It just means it's been found in at least part of the county so far. And then the yellow counties, these are areas where spotted lanternfly is already known to exist. So it's been found in you know, 2021 or years prior. Okay, so then when you're on the map, you'll want to zoom in a little bit closer and you'll get to a point where the counties and the boundaries of those counties will disappear and you'll start to see little grid squares. And that's where the name of this map is coming from. We call it our grid square map and that's why we're calling it that. And so each of these grid squares are one kilometer in size and some of them um, have different colors. And so I'm going to talk through what those colors mean for the grid squares. So we do have some grid squares that are red. There isn't a lot. Uh, we are gonna be adding some more red uh, focus squares as we are calling them. Um, so if you are looking for a lot of red squares, um, you won't see too many right now, but there is some. So these red squares are focus areas and they are essentially um, specific areas that we, where we reached out to natural resource professionals and some other experts across the state and they identify these areas as really important places where we should be conduct conducting survey efforts to help to aid in that early detection of spotted lanternfly. So in addition to looking for spotted lanternfly in these focus areas, certainly we also wanna be looking for tree of heaven as well. Again, we know the connection between spotted lanternfly and tree of heaven. So we wanna make sure we're looking for both of those species. And then, as I mentioned, we will be adding more additional focus areas to the map. So again, uh, there isn't a lot of these red focus uh, grid squares on the map currently, but we will be adding more as we go on. But I would say in general, um, all counties that are either the high priority, which again are those red counties, or the medium priority, again, the ones that are orange in color, these are really all also considered focus areas. So you can think of as a whole county. Um, as a focus, but narrowing in on specific locations, um, we are calling those our focus areas, those, those red grid squares. And I just want to mention too, 
all of our claimable survey areas or our grid squares have at least 50% public accessible land. And this is really important because you'll notice on the map and in this screenshot, you can see that here, not all of the map has grid squares. And that's because there is a lot of private property. So we're not um, encouraging you to survey on private property, certainly not. Um, if you do wanna survey in an area that has private property, please make sure that you reach out to that landowner, request permission to be on their property and request permission to actually survey and report your findings um, online. So again, these grid squares that are claimable um, have at least 50% public accessible land. Okay, so then we have some other grid squares on our map that we're calling non-focus. Um, and so these are areas where, again, we're just hoping to get more volunteer surveyors out to detect possible locations of spotted lanternfly and tree of heaven. And I just wanna make sure that I make very clear that our non-focus areas are not necessarily low priority locations. That is not true at all. They're, they're certainly a priority. All these areas are a priority. But we did, as I mentioned with the focus areas, have some folks reach out to us and say, hey, it would be really great to get some extra eyes at this particular location. And so we just differentiated those focus areas in that way to make sure that we're getting some eyes on the ground. But certainly um, these non-focus areas are a priority as well. And then we also have some grid squares that you'll notice that are colored green. And these are what we're calling our tree of heaven grid squares. And these are areas where we know that tree of heaven is uh, existing, it is present on site, according to data that we already have in IMAP invasives. And so this information was really valuable to include in our map, because as we know, the connection between these two species with Tree of Heaven and Spotted Lanternfly, the presence of a Tree of Heaven tree may present a higher likelihood that uh, Spotted Lanternfly is present on site or nearby. And so hopefully the green squares that we see on the map may help to say spotted lanternfly might be here more so than some other locations. Again, any, any grid square that we have on the map, whether it's a focus, a non-focus, or a tree of heaven, is going to be really valuable to survey at. But this is one way, um, one structure that we're using to try to kind of give some more information and, and um, you know, guidance for how to choose where to survey. OK, so I already did mention private property. Again, if you are surveying in an area that has private property, just make sure that uh, if you do want to survey there, you're asking permission. Feel free to exclude surveying on private property altogether and just only um, you know, focus on the publicly accessible land that's in your general area that you're choosing. So a grid square, the way we have things set up on our map, can only be claimed by one individual to go survey there. So if an area that you would like to go survey at has already been claimed on the map, feel free to go and survey there too, just without actually claiming that area on the map. And you can still submit data just as you would normally, um, you know, by going and submitting your data to IMAP or to the Penn State Extension online tool. Again, as I mentioned, there is some locations on the map that don't have any grid squares. So the way that the map was set up is that we got the publicly accessible information and we use that to um, identify the areas that people could survey. So if there is an area that just doesn't have a grid square that you want to claim to essentially go and survey there, again, feel free to survey in that location without actually claiming anything on the map. Again, keeping in mind the private property. And I do also wanna mention that as you're out surveying, please make sure you're being safe. Um, only go in areas that you feel comfortable in that are not presenting any kind of safety hazard. So for example, avoid climbing up really steep cliffs. Um, don't survey along busy highways. Don't be walking along river corridors, those sorts of things. You know, common sense is really valuable here. Okay, so next I'm going to show a video demonstration of how to claim a grid square. Um, so I recorded this yesterday. And so just to make sure I didn't have any hiccups or anything today, the video demonstration hopefully will work fairly well. So I'll go ahead and start playing that. So this is gonna be a demonstration of how to use the survey grid square web application. 
So the first thing you're going to want to do is zoom in on the map to the county that you're interested in surveying in. You'll notice that the color of the county will disappear and it will be replaced with these grid squares that you can choose to select. So I'm going to zoom in on the map. I'm looking at Moraine State Park. I'm going to go ahead and click on my selection button. You'll notice that it turns uh, blue. That means it's been selected and ready to use. The drop down arrow next to the selection tool gives you different ways that you can make a selection. I'm going to go ahead and stick with point for now. And I'm going to click on a square. There should be something that shows up in the grid square selection box. There is a glitch in the system for whatever reason when you use the point option. But all you need to do to fix that problem is just click in a different square and then click back again in the square that you're interested in. And then you will notice that an identification number shows up. That's what's supposed to happen. So this identification number is specific to this particular grid square. So if that's the one that you want to select, go ahead and click on that identification number. And then you'll notice that a claim form will show up in the uh, right side of your screen. So you want to go ahead and switch the claim status from unclaimed to claim. You're going to want to enter your IMAP invasive person ID number. The way that you obtain that number is if you go to the Pennsylvania IMAP Invasives website, which is paimapinvasives.org, go ahead and click on the login button. If you don't already have a login account, you'll want to sign up for one here. If you do already have an account, go ahead and enter your existing login credentials. And then the database will load. And from there, you'll go to the upper left corner of your screen, click on the main menu, and go to where it says your account. And then from there, you'll see there is a number where it says person ID. This is the number that we're interested in. So I'm going to go ahead and copy that number and paste it right in here. And then from there, go ahead and continue filling in the form with your email address, your first and last name, and today's date, and click Submit. And that's it. That's all you have to do to claim your grid square. If you want to make sure that your, uh, your grid square did indeed get claimed, if you reload the application and then go down here to where it says view claim grid squares, uh, there is a place where it says none. If you go ahead and you click on that and either type in or select your um, IMAP invasive person ID number, you'll notice that one number over here does show up. That is the grid square that you just claimed. You can actually go ahead and click on that and it will zoom to that location where you claim your grid square. And you'll notice then that um, the color of that grid square has been filled in, indicating that it is claimed and no one else can claim that, that square at this time. So that's it. If there is any questions on how to use the map, there is a link down here at the bottom that you can click on. And that will take you to a story map that's been created specifically for this event. And it has um, all the information that you need to know about how to use the map um, and other details associated with uh, surveying for Tree of Heaven and Spotted Lanternfly. So this upper uh, horizontal navigation pane is a way that you can quickly get to any of the um, categories within the story map. So it's a quick way to advance to those locations. So that's it. And thanks for listening. Okay, so that gives an overview of how to claim your area that you would like to survey. Um, now let's dive into how to actually report and where to report your findings. So the survey time frame is going to be the summer and the fall. Um, it'll go from June to November. So again, we're asking folks that want to participate in this survey to claim one or more locations and then visit those locations at least two or three times during that time. Again, looking for a spotted lantern fly and tree of heaven, you're gonna be reporting um, both presence and absence information. And if you have any questions um, after today's training or as you're going through throughout the year, we will have information that will remain on our website under the events page that you can reference uh, if you need to. 
We'll also have um, a recording of today's training posted on our website, uh, as well as any other information that will be helpful. If you do have questions that are not answered on our website, you can feel free to reach out to me directly. My email address is there on the screen. Also, I wanna mention, so where are you gonna be reporting your information? So this is really important. I wanna make sure that I uh, emphasize this. So any presence information for spotted lanternfly, please report that directly to the Penn State Extension online reporting tool. And in a few moments, I'm gonna be showing you where you can access that online um, and how to use it. So again, I'll say that one more time, very important, make sure you're reporting any presence information for spotted lanternfly to the Penn State Extension online reporting tool. Um, Floor also mentioned that there is a phone number that you can call. So if you prefer to use the phone number, then that also is an option. But um, Penn State Extension in conjunction with the Department of Agriculture has put together a really slick online tool um, that's really uh, super easy to use and I would recommend uh, using that. Any other data that you're reporting, so absence information for spotted lanternfly, you look for spotted lanternfly and you didn't find it, and then any data for tree of heaven, whether that's presence or absence, please report that to IMAP invasives. Okay, and I just wanna go over really quickly for those that aren't familiar with these two reporting tools. So the Penn State Extension online reporting tool is a database that's being hosted by Penn State Extension and in conjunction with Department of Agriculture. Any information that gets submitted to that tool goes directly to the Department of Agriculture. That is their mechanism, in addition to a phone number that they're using to collect reports for spotted lanternfly from the general public. The tool is free to use. Uh, again, only collects data on spotted lanternfly and only accepts presence information. So you actually found you know, the insect or an egg mass uh, or something like that. IMAP Invasives is also available online, but this is a uh, database where we are tracking all taxa of invasive species, so plants and animals. Um, it is GIS and mapped based, and it is used by a variety of people, um, natural resource professionals and community scientists. Again, free to use. We track not only presence information in IMAP, but also not detected, as I mentioned, and also treatment or any kind of management that people are doing for invasives across the state. So I just wanna make sure that I'm differentiating between how these two are a little similar, but also a little different. Okay, so if you've not used the Penn State Extension Spotted Lanternfly online reporting tool before, I'm gonna walk you through how to do that. So if you just Google a Penn State Extension Spotted Lanternfly, this um, image that you see here on the left-hand side is the website that will come, that will appear. The link to this website is also listed just below that. And you'll notice that the ability to report is right up at the top. They wanted to make it fairly easy for folks to find that information. If you click on report, this uh, page that you see here on the right-hand side will appear. It's giving you different things for the various life stages of spotted lanternfly that if you saw an egg mass, yes, this is it, go ahead and click on that and so on and so forth for the various um, spotted lanternfly life stages. If you then go ahead and um, click on that, it'll take you to the actual reporting tool. This is what it looks like. So you'll see a map of the state. There is information over on the left-hand side that gives you instructions on how to use it. So there's a um, bar in the upper right corner where you can add an address, um, GPS coordinates, or a place name, and it will zoom to that location. And from there, you can actually click on the appropriate area where you made your sighting. From there, it will pop up a window that says whether your finding is um, either outside or inside of the quarantine zone. It will also have uh, a form that you can fill out. Uh, and this is what the form will look like. So it's gonna ask for your contact information. The place where your sighting was made should fill in automatically based on what you did on the map. And then it's gonna have some additional things that it's gonna ask you for. And the one thing that I would recommend or encourage folks to do is if you are finding spotted lantern fly and you're reporting based on this survey with our program with IMAP Invasives, just mention in the comments and special instructions area that your report is associated 
with the Pennsylvania IMAP Invasives 2022 survey. And that'll be a way for a Department of Agriculture to know that we're helping to support their efforts um, and that this report is associated with our survey. So now jumping over to IMAP Invasives, if you are finding um, any other type of data, again, uh, referencing that any data that you goes into IMAP is going to be for the absence of spotted lanternfly or presence and absence of tree of heaven. So if you um, already have a login account, or if you still need to sign up for one, go to our website, paimapinvasives.org. And then from there, you can either log in or sign up for an account. Um, so you'll see a screen that looks like this. And from there, um, you'll go ahead and choose how you want to uh, report your findings. So unfortunately, we're running a little short on time. So I'm going to skip over some of these videos that I have in the um, PowerPoint today. But these are available online, and I do have links where you can uh, watch them on YouTube. This first video is a demonstration of how to use the IMAP Invasives mobile app. So you can check that out when you have some time. That is one way that you can report data to IMAP invasives. We also have um, another app that is used with Survey123. Um, and that's a way, that's a separate app that you can actually use by incorporating a special data form um, where it's uh, incorporating fields that you would collect that then can be, go, that can be um, inserted into IMAP invasives and be submitted to the database. Uh, this was a video that Brian Daggs, our invasive plant ecologist, put together. Again, this is also available on YouTube. And again, because we're running a little short on time, I'm going to skip over this for now. But please make sure that you're checking out these videos so that you know how to use these tools. And then you also have the option of reporting data to IMAP invasives from the actual online database itself. And the database can be accessed from any device, whether that's a phone or a tablet or your computer. Um, excuse me, so as long as you have access to the internet, you will be able to um, use our online database. And in the um, top row, you'll see a button where it says create record. If you click on that, it will give you a window that pops up and you can then choose what data you want to enter, whether that's presence or not detected. And it will then go through a series of uh, fields that you can fill out um, and you can enter data that way as well. So I just want to go over the three ways that you can enter data with IMAP invasives. Um, and again, it's really important that when you're participating in this survey, you'll want to plan out how you want to report your records prior to actually conducting your surveys. What is going to be the best method that will work well for you. And so this table outlines the different um, tools that each of these um, uh, opportunities, these data collection opportunities provide. And so we can see that all of the, both of the mobile apps and our online database, you can record presence and not detected. And so that's gonna be um, fairly open-ended. You can use any of them. However, if you want to record specific types of data like lines and polygons, um, only our Survey123 app and our online database can do that. Our basic mobile app uh, is point-based only. Also, if you want to collect data while you're out in the field and you do not have an internet connection, both of our mobile apps can be used for that, whereas the online database, you will need to be connected to um, the internet in order to use that. So this is a helpful table that kind of walks through that. Again, planning things out beforehand, what's the best way that you can use these tools to collect your data with. You will be able to um, view data in IMAP invasives after you submit it, or if you're interested in looking uh, at data that other folks have entered. So for example, as we go through this event, again, it's gonna go for the summer and the fall, it'll be neat to see the data that starts coming in. And so there is a tool called filter records, again, up in the upper, um, uh, part of the screen when you're logged into the online database. From here, you should be able to choose whatever field you're interested in. So the, there's a species drop down that you can choose tree of heaven. If you're interested in only looking at your records, you can use the observer drop down to choose your name. And this will show all the records that then will come up based on the filter um, that you select. 
You'll also want to make sure that when you run a filter, you're turning on the appropriate layers to make sure that the information is coming up that you anticipate should show up. And so there is several layers that I would um, just encourage you to just automatically remember to go in and turn on. They will not all automatically turn on themselves. So you need to make sure that you're doing that yourself. So the first layer that is turned on here is our confirmed layer. That is information where that has been expert vetted. Um, it's gone through the process of being looked at and we know for sure based on the photographs that that species is indeed correctly identified. We also have a data layer that's called unconfirmed, and that's any data that's been submitted to IMAP Invasives, whether that was through a mobile app or the online database uh, that just hasn't been looked at by an expert yet. So say you just uh, submitted a data record for Tree of Heaven yesterday, and you wanna go in and look at it here in the database, you'll wanna make sure that that unconfirmed data layer is turned on to make sure that you can see your data point. We also have a data layer that's called approximate, and that's essentially also confirmed information, but the GPS coordinates are not exact for a location. So something might be mapped, you know, slightly like 20 feet, you know, off uh, to the left or something, um, or maybe if it's an aquatic species, for example, it's mapped somewhere within a water body. But again, really valuable to make sure that you're turning on the approximate data too. We also have our not detected layer. So again, if you wanna see areas where people are surveying for a species and not finding it, that's gonna be your not detected information. I do wanna make sure I mention, cause this can be confusing sometimes for folks. So because spotted lanternfly uh, is such a highly regulated species in our state, and even though we do offer the ability for people to report spotted lanternfly to IMAP invasives, um, we still encourage folks to use that Penn State um, Extension online tool, especially for this uh, particular event. But any data that we have for spotted lanternfly and IMAP invasives is listed as confidential, and therefore it cannot be viewed by the general public. And we do that on purpose because we want to make sure that we're not um, divulging any information that should not be shown to the public sooner than it should be. Again, that's in the hands of the Department of Agriculture. Uh, and so any data that we do get in IMAP invasives automatically, um, or may I should say it's manually added to that online reporting tool that I showed you by one of our staff to make sure that the, the department is getting that information. Um, so just so you know, if you do submit any data for spotted lanternfly, whether it's, well, for IMAP anyway, you're only gonna be um, entering absence information, you will not be able to see it. So I wanna make sure that that isn't confusing. Again, that's just based on the structure of how the system is set up. Um, so if you're checking to make sure that a spotted lanternfly record did get uh, submitted to IMAP, you won't be able to see that yourself. So feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions or you're not sure that something is getting submitted appropriately. But I just wanna make sure that I mention that. Okay, so I wanna quickly wrap up here. Um, I also just want to mention, in, in addition to surveying and reporting, it's really valuable um, and important to remember that you're taking good photographs um, of anything that you are reporting. And so it's really important to make sure that you're getting up close to the thing that you're looking at, um, you know, within arm's reach or closer is the um, kind of target range that I tell folks. Make sure that your camera is not taking a fuzzy photo. Make sure that it's honing in on the thing that you want it to see. And make sure you're not taking photos from a distance. Um, it's good if you're able to take several photos. And in that case, it would be fine to take a photo from a distance. But it's also really valuable to make sure that you're taking photos that are up close. I will mention with a mobile app, um, the basic mobile app, Currently, you're only able to take one photo per record. Um, so you wanna make sure that's the really good uh, photo that has good distinguishing characteristics in it. The Survey123 app, I believe you can take up to five photographs and save that with your record. So if you're using Survey123, you'll be able to take um, photos that might be from a distance, but also again, um, closer up as well. And I should mention too, with the online database, you can also um, add, I think, up to five photos as well. So it's just the basic mobile app that's limited currently to only having one photo per record. And Scott gave a great overview for Tree of Heaven, but I just want to mention here again, in reference to taking pictures, 
that you're honing in on those specific distinguishing characteristics of that species, because that's what we're going to need in order to confirm your record and then actually have it be listed um, as a confirmed record in the database. And so, um, you know, the, the leaflets on Tree of Heaven have the noticeable notch near the base. So that's something that you can kind of hone in on. If you turn the leaflets over and you'll see the glands um, on the back side, that's another thing that's going to be a distinguishing characteristic. And Scott mentioned about the, uh, the leaf and bud scars of Tree of Heaven, um, how that's very unique. And also the bark can resemble the skin of a cantaloupe. So all of these things are really valuable to include in your photographs to make sure that we can actually confirm your record um, at the end of the day. So the event, uh, the survey uh, that we've been talking about today is gonna start today and it's gonna go till the end of November. So starting today, go ahead, claim a grid square and start surveying as you're able to. Uh, again, keeping in mind, we're requesting that folks go out about two to three times uh, during the, the survey timeframe. Be sure to report all of your observation data, both presence and absence during this time. And you can feel free to claim a grid square today. And then two months down the road, feel free to claim another grid square if you want to. Uh, you can claim as many grid squares as you, are, as you want, but make sure that if you are claiming an area, you are going out and surveying there. We wanna make sure that um, you know, that's, that's uh, something that we're keeping in mind and we're not taking an area from someone else that may want to, to survey there. If you have a grid square that you claim by accident or you claim it and then you know that you're not able to go there, uh, you can unclaim a grid square uh, by, by reaching out to me and I will take care of that for you. So this is my last slide. I do wanna mention that there is um, some prizes that are available um, to you. So in December, once this event wraps up, five randomly chosen individuals uh, will be selected as our winners for this year's event. And in order to qualify as a prize winner, you have to do each of the following things. You have to register um, for this event, whether that's attending today's training or watching the recording afterwards and then letting me know that you did watch it so that I can have your name on our registration list. Then you'll need to select at least one grid square um, to survey at using our online map. And then please visit your selected site at least two times during the event timeframe, again, sometime between June and November. And then during each visit, you'll need to submit at least one record to IMAP invasives, whether that's a presence or absence record. Again, keeping in mind, please only report presence information for spotted lanternfly to the Penn State's tool and all other data can come to IMAP invasives. And so the prize package, uh, will include a gift card to Camp Moore, uh, a write in the rain notebook. And if folks aren't familiar with that, it's a really cool uh, notepad that you can take out in the field with you. And even if the pages get wet, you can still write on it. So it's a really great field notebook um, for, for individuals that like to take notes while they're out in the field. A Nalgene bottle, because um, you'll need to stay hydrated while you're out there, and also an invasive species field guide. So that is a wrap. Um, I don't have any more information, but I do want to have um, information here if folks want to reach out to us for questions. Uh, my email address is here as well as Floor and Scott. So at this time, we can transition over to our questions that we have. And Brian Daggs, if you don't mind coming off of mute, and maybe you can help um, to uh, kind of go through the questions, maybe some that have already been answered and some that we still need to um, make sure that we get to. So Brian, if you don't mind coming off a of mute, maybe you can help to um, go through things. Yeah. Uh, hello? Do you hear yep, me? I, yep, I can hear you. Okay, perfect. Um, so right now we've got a couple folks who have already uh, tried to go in and claim grid squares, and they are saying that they need some sort of login information. Has the, has the map been updated yet? For people to claim yet or were we waiting until after the training is over so if they are not able to log in i will have to uh double check that on our end if there is is some issues with that um so i'll check in with molly the person who made our map and make sure that everything um is working appropriately uh just to make sure that we are um 
getting everyone to be able to log in correctly. Uh, if folks can just email me and say, hey, I'm having some trouble. Uh, I just wanna make sure that it's working appropriately for everyone. So that's a way for me to kind of follow up with anyone that's having that trouble. So I apologize if that's happening for folks. We'll, we'll get it fixed as soon as possible. Okay. Um... There were some questions regarding lookalikes for spotted lanternfly, and I believe Floor mentioned in the comments that she was willing to share some additional information on those. So um, go ahead, Floor, if you have some stuff ready. Thank you, Ryan. Can you see my screen? Yes, I can okay. see it. Oh, thank you. There are a number of insects that resemble spotted lanternfly. So here in these pictures we have, in the center we have a spotted lanternfly, and then on the sides we have uh, different species of moths. So how can you tell? Like for me, it's pretty easy to distinguish them, but for people who are unsure, um, it's very easy. So first characteristic, moths and butterflies have antennae. They have antennae coming out of the head, right? Spotted lanternfly, it does have antennae, but it's very, very small. So you cannot see anything coming out of the head like this way, right? And you can see all moths have this antennae, right? The other way is you can touch the wings with your fingers of the specimens that you are unsure of. And if they are moths, then you will end up having sort of like dust. It will look like dust in your fingers because um, these wings are covered with the scales. And when you touch them, then you remove those scales and you end up having that in your fingers. Whereas if you do the same with a spider lanternfly, you shouldn't end up having any dust in your fingers. So those are two easy ways to distinguish. Okay, uh, there was another question on, egg masses. Are there any other egg masses from different insects that look like spider lanternfly egg masses? So I just did a quick uh, Google search about moth egg masses and this is what I found. So yes, there are different egg masses that, uh, there are egg masses from different insects that might look alike, but how can you tell? It is easy. The wax or the substance that covered spider lanternfly eggs is water soluble. So you can take a brush, a paintbrush, or you can take maybe a towel um, with water and then it, like very gentle, try to clean the egg masses. And when you do that, then this is how they look. They are big and they have these um, sort of openings on the top. These are spider lanternfly egg masses. Whereas if they are moth egg masses, then you won't be able to see the individual eggs and they're discovered because they are so small. So last season we found uh, there, was a, there were a number of people reporting egg masses and they thought they were spider lanternfly egg masses, but they end up being full army worm egg masses. Why? Because they just look brown. <laughs> but the egg masses of moths, they can be big, but the eggs inside those egg masses are so tiny. So there are just, there's just no way to, <laughs> they can't be confused because um, egg masses from a spider lanternfly are really big. So you can really, like the eggs are really big, you can really tell that different. Okay, so how many egg masses can an SLF female lay? It depends because the adults emerge in August or late October or even September, depending on temperature. So what happens is that they emerge as adults and then they need to mate. And then they need time because they need to eat and they need to gain, gain enough fat and enough uh, nutrients in order to mature those eggs. So. In our experiments in Bears County last year, we found that it took about 30 days from the day that those insects emerged as adults to the time that they were actually able to uh, start laying eggs. And the 
adults can lay eggs only until first frost because they are killed with the first frost that last year happened in November. So they only have some, some time to do that. And that again depends on the environmental conditions of each place. But in our experiments, we found up to we found that a single female could lay up to five egg masses during that short time from August to early November. Females might be able to lay more egg masses, but they just were killing that first frost. So we cannot tell um, what is the reproductive capacity of this insect. There was another question about predators. There are a number of predators that uh, feed on SLF stages, nymphs and adults and even eggs. But there are, they are just not enough of them. They don't eat as much as, um, as, as needed in order to decrease the populations of these pests. So they're there, but they, they don't really make like a huge difference in decimating those populations. And that's what I have. Are there any other questions, uh, Brian, there that I didn't address? Um, no, I think you went into detail on uh, a lot of the questions asked. Thank you for that. Um, mm -hmm. Are there any other questions at this time? Or if you asked a question earlier and you maybe want some more information, feel free to ask again. Um, I see Scott here is asking, do birds like spotted lanternfly? Flora, do you have any insight on whether birds like spotted lanternfly or not? They do eat it, um, some. <laughs> they eat some of them. But we are currently studying how many they can eat at a time. Because what happens is that a spotted lanternfly feeds on Tree of Heaven. And it appears that it sequesters some of those quasinoids that Tree of Heaven plants have. And those quasinoids can either be toxic or can be distasteful. They can make the insect taste bad. So we are currently studying um, if that affects, like if, an, if a bird eats one, would it eat a second one based on the experience that it had before? Will it be toxic for the birds? And so we're, we're testing that not only for birds, but also for other uh, predators. So yes, they eat it, but we don't know how many they can eat at a time. Thank you. Um, we have a couple more questions rolling in. Um, does the female have to mate in between each egg laying or can she lay all five egg masses at one time? We are studying that, we don't know. We know it can, meet, it can mate several times, but we don't know if it's needed in order to lay more egg masses. So we're still, we still don't know. Okay. Um, relative to size information of adults, nymphs and egg, oh, relative information of Relative information on the sizes of adults, nymphs, and eggs may be useful to know. So, you know, just comparing the sizes to maybe common items such as, you know, pennies or quarters. What are what are the relative sizes of these different life stages that we see in spotted lanternfly? Okay, give me a few seconds. I put a slide in my screenshot and I'll show it. <laughs> I feel that it's easier to show it than it is to speak it. So let's continue with other questions and I'll show you once I have it, okay? Because I do have a few a few pictures. The, the, the insects are large, especially the, the adults. They are, um, let me just find a picture to show you. Um, let's continue with another. Uh, Molly Moore, our uh, GIS specialist, uh, is, uh, is asking if anyone is able to try accessing the grid square map again. Perhaps she's updated that for people to claim squares now. So, and, uh, and we see that it seems like people are starting to have success with that. So it sounds like the grid square map is working as intended. Great. Thank you so much, Molly, for the quick fix there. Okay, for people that are still around, here's a picture that shows um, the size. 
with respect to a quarter. So they're pretty large, especially the adults. Wow, though, that first nymph is tiny compared to the adult. Yeah. Uh, but but thank you. That shows for very clearly the um the size reference. Yeah. Thank you, Flor. You're welcome. Okay. Last call for any questions. If there are none, then Amy, I think you're good to go ahead and wrap things up. Yeah, thanks, Brian, for kind of helping out there. I appreciate it. Um, so I just want to say thanks again, um, Floor, Scott, your expertise was really awesome to have as part of uh, today's training. So I really appreciate your, your time. Um, if anyone else, else has any questions, um, feel free to reach out to myself or if you um, want to reach out to Floor or Scott directly with a question for them, uh, I'm sure they'll be happy to respond to you as soon as they're able to. And go ahead and start claiming your grid squares um, and get out and start surveying. It'll be really great to see the data that's coming in from that. And if we are able to find any new populations of spotted lanternfly that we don't already know about, uh, that'll be really good to be able to, um, to get that going. And hopefully the Department of Agriculture will of course be part of any response that has to um, happen from that. So. Thanks again, everyone. Um, and I wish everyone a, a good rest of your day. So take care.